Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Lessons from Nehemiah, Rebuilding Broken Walls. I'm Alistair Kirk of Christians United for Israel UK, and I'm delighted that you can join me as we continue exploring Jerusalem's gates as recorded in Nehemiah chapter 3. If you enjoy this video, please remember to like and share, and to catch up with previous episodes, please go to uh, our website at cufi.org. UK forward slash Nehemiah. Our last time we considered the fountain gate, which was near the pool of Siloam, and the water gate, which was near Gihon Spring. We now continue moving along the eastern side to the horse gate, east gate, and inspection gate. These gates speak of great expectation, great expectation, because all those who put their trust in Jehovah have a great hope of things yet to come. Let's begin with the horse gate. You probably know by now that a gate's description is a good clue to its purpose, and so you will be correct to associate this gate with horses. The horse gate was the closest to the royal palace of King David and Solomon, situated just south of the Temple Mount. It was a heavily fortified gate containing four chambers. And situated near the gate inside the city were the king's stables. In fact, the Bible says that among his wealth and riches, King Solomon had between 4,000 to 40,000 stores for his horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. At the height of Israel's military strength, the horse gate was a symbol of royal power and might. This is a gate through which Israel's kings would exit and enter Jerusalem in royal processional grandeur. It would also be where Israel's armies would leave and return for battle. Here, two pictures emerge. Firstly, we must remember that Jerusalem was a royal city, inasmuch as it was a holy city. In fact, the two are interlinked. Psalm 2 verse 6 says, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. And in Isaiah, we read one of the many references to the throne of David. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. Jerusalem is a city like no other on earth. It has a royal seal stamped upon it. As the prophet Nathan spoke the words of the Lord to David, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. Hallelujah. So the horse gate reminds us of the royal assignment upon Jerusalem. And the second picture the horse gate lends is the king's might in warfare. For example, the Kidron Valley, which is beyond the horse gate, is famous for many Bible events, including where King Jehoshaphat overthrew the enemies of Israel. In fact, it is understood the Valley of Jehoshaphat within the Kidron Valley is the same location mentioned in Joel chapter 3, where God will deal with the enemies of Israel. It says this, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel whom they have scattered among the nations, they have also divided up my land. Israel depended upon the horse gate for conquest in military warfare. But an important lesson emerges in the conquest within spiritual warfare. King David penned in Psalm 27, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Meanwhile, Psalm 33, 16 states, No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. So once again, as we have seen with all the gates in Nehemiah 3, we begin to understand that its literal purpose is a shadow of what God has destined for his people that we look to a city, as it says in Hebrews, whose builder and maker is God. 
This horse gate challenges us to question whether we are putting our trust in horses and chariots or whether we are putting our trust in Almighty God, who is able to deliver us from the enemy, who brings us conquest in spiritual warfare, who is victorious in battle. Isaiah 31 says this, and before we read, it's helpful to note that many of Solomon's horses were imported in large numbers from Egypt. Isaiah chapter 31 says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. And verse 3, Now the Egyptians are men, and are not God, and their horses are flesh, and not spirit. How I need this reminder, as I'm sure you may do as well. The Egyptians are men, and not God. Their horses are flesh, and not spirit. That person you've put all your trust in is man, not God. That politician is man, not God. That thing you're hanging all your hope on, it's man, not God. Instead, let's put our trust in God, the Holy One of Israel. Our help comes from the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, the God of Israel, the King of kings, who rules and reigns, whose kingdom will endure and whose throne will be established forever and ever. Amen. Next, we come to the East Gate. The word for East in Nehemiah 3 literally means rising of the sun. The East Gate is one of the most talked about and speculative gates in history. It was the gate with best access to the temple. It is said that the inside of the temple was visible from the Mount of Olives looking directly through the opened East Gate. In fact, some say this was likely the gate through which Jesus rode through on a donkey from the Mount of Olives. Today, the East Gate that Nehemiah rebuilt is buried underground. In its place is the iconic Eastern Gate, commonly known as Golden Gate. In Hebrew, it is known as the Gate of Mercy, perhaps because at one time during the medieval period, it was the closest point to the Temple Mount, the holiest site in Judaism, that Jews could pray at. And although opinions vary, it is believed to have been first built around four centuries or so after Christ. That said, some archaeologists date two doorposts as first temple era, and some believe the original East Gate is directly beneath this more recent Golden Gate. One thing to point out though, is that we shouldn't dismiss the significance of these later gates. After all, Jerusalem is a tapestry with layer upon layer of history. Take Nehemiah for example. He repaired or in some cases completely rebuilt the gates from David's Solomon era, first temple era, sometimes even forced to reposition slightly. But it doesn't detract from their original significance. The Bible says that the instructions the Lord gave to King David were spirit-led, and God loves the gates of Zion. So we look today at the Eastern Gate with some deep questions. Christians and Jews share a special interest in the Eastern Gate, or the Gate of Mercy. It represents great hope. Jewish tradition says that the Messiah will pass through the Eastern Gate when he comes to rule. To try and prevent the Jewish Messiah from gaining entry to Jerusalem, the Eastern Gate was sealed shut by the Muslims in the 9th century, reopened by the Crusaders and then blocked up again by Saladin in the 12th century. Major reconstruction took place in the 16th century at the order of the Ottoman Sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent, fortifying the gate into the fortress we see today. The gate was blocked by 16 feet of cement and it has remained closed for the past 500 years. A Muslim cemetery was placed directly in front of the gate, thinking it would prevent a Jewish messiah from setting foot. And as recent as 2019, the basement within the interior of the gate was reopened for Muslim worshippers to pray inside from the Temple Mount. 
but the gate itself remains sealed. This deliberate obstruction has understandably prompted plenty of anticipation in terms of Bible prophecy. Meanwhile, the book of Ezekiel contains several very important references to a gate that faces east, particularly at the entrance to the temple, that point us to the millennial reign of the Messiah. One example in Ezekiel 43 states, Afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, his voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. And in Ezekiel 44, it says, Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces toward the east, but it was shut. And the Lord said to me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter by it, because the Lord God of Israel has entered by it, therefore it shall be shut. Zechariah prophesied that the Messiah will stand with his feet on the Mount of Olives, which will be split in two. As Christians, we believe that Jesus will return to the Mount of Olives in the same manner as he ascended in fulfilment of the scriptures. This promise has led many to conclude that Jesus returning as Messiah King will therefore re-enter Jerusalem through a gate from the east and then it will be sealed behind him as described in Ezekiel. It's interesting that in the ancient world, uh, if a monarch entered a city, the gate would be shut behind them uh, for a period out of reverence. There's plenty of food for thought that we can explore in our personal study and pray about. But let me just say this. Despite our obvious theological differences, Christians and Jews share a great expectation as symbolized in the Eastern Gate. The attempt to thwart the Messiah's entry into Jerusalem is in vain. Personally speaking, I believe no bricks and mortar will be able to stop the return of my Messiah, the King of Kings. Just as the stone over the tomb couldn't prevent his resurrection on the third day, so too will it be on the day of his return. For on that ground-shaking and glorious day, when he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, not even a sealed fortified gate will be able to stop his glorious appearing from being fulfilled. Amen. The final gate as recorded in Nehemiah 3 is the inspection gate, situated just above the east gate facing the temple. The Hebrew word used in our passage is actually Mishkad gate. Mishkad literally means appointed place. Or assignment. In the time of King David, according to tradition, this gate was the location that David would meet his troops to inspect them. At the time of Jesus, the Mishkad gate was associated with taxation and census taking. The Romans used uh, to count heads at certain designated locations and also collect ransom payments. In fact, Mishkad comes from a root verb which means to number. Thus, it carried the connotation of being an appointed place of inspection, registration, counting, judgment. Interestingly, the name for Roman census taking translates counting of the schools, from which the Greek word Golgotha derives. The gate has also been called the gate of gathering, and this reminds us of the gathering of the nations that will one day take place where Christ will judge righteously. Matthew chapter 25 says this, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them, one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, 
and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Interestingly, when Jesus referred to his brethren uh, in verse 40, he was referring to his brethren, the Jewish people. That's right. Our treatment of the Jewish people will be taken into account when he judges the Gentile nations. But there is also an inspection that takes place now, if you will. An inspection that we must be undertaking ourselves. As King David stood at the gate and inspected his troops, the examining of ourselves is a biblical principle. As David penned in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. May this be our prayer, because self-inspection will always reveal to us our greatest need. Our need is for complete surrender to God. We need his leading. We need God. We need to come to him. And if the gates of Jerusalem have shown us anything, it is that he has provided us with everything in this walk of faith. No wonder the Lord loves the gates of Zion. Next time, we will begin chapter 4 and a change of track as we take a closer analysis of Nehemiah's opposition. It's an important episode in which I will reveal how verses in Nehemiah unlock a pattern of anti-Semitism that has manifested itself throughout millennia. And we will discover how it reveals to us warning signals that cannot be ignored today. So please join me for this important episode next time. Thank you for watching. May God bless you and I will see you next time.